Welcome to Celebrating Act 2. Celebrating Act 2 is the user manual for the second half of your life. Welcome back to our Celebrating Act 2 audience, and our special guest today is John Mariani, the virtual gourmet. Hi, John, and my great partner, John Coleman. Hi, hi guys. Oh. Hi, hi, guys. John, um, I wanted to um, uh, point you in a direction today because um, years ago, a friend told me that when I was in Buffalo, I had a business trip to Buffalo. When I was there, I had to go to the Anchor Bar and Grill and have the original Buffalo Wings. That's where they originated. That's true. And I did. And I was kind of amazed that it's just a little local pub yep. and they had jazz and they, but I ordered the Buffalo Wings and they, they were, they were awfully good. But the idea that they originated in just a, a simple restaurant bar, in, in this case, uh, and became famous. There's a bunch of foods like that, aren't there? I, 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 tell me some of them, where, where, the, where these classic American dishes originated. And every great American dish, there's a great story. Well, not so great all the time, but there's a story. And buffalo chicken wings is one that uh, happened back, I'm going to have to glance at my notes sometime, but this happened back in about 1966. And the Anchor Bar and Grill had always been there, and they didn't serve buffalo chicken wings or any kind of chicken wings, but they had a supply of chicken. They chopped the wings off. And so Teresa Bellissimo was the owner of the place, and her sons came in at about 10 to midnight, 10 to 12 at night on a Friday night, and they were starving. And she says, so she's a good Catholic, so she says, well, you can't eat meat. So if you to wait till midnight, I'll fry up well, whatever we got left because the bar, the, the, the kitchen is closed. She fried them up, just tossed them in a fryer, mixed together this hot sauce, and for some reason, let's suck some celery on there. And uh, it was a butter, butter hot sauce with ketchup. And it became a local hit. But it wasn't until Craig Claiborne and then of the New York Times wrote about it uh, nationally in the New York Times said this is one of the great American foods that it just went bada bing. And they even had after that the mayor gave them uh, buffalo chicken wings uh, day up there. And uh, and the thing is that she gave Craig Claiborne the recipe. So it's not secret. <laughs> so it's uh, it's something that was copied and copied and copied. And now you cannot go into a an IHOP, a Denny's, a TGI Friday's, a Hooters, or, or anything else without finding buffalo chicken wings. There's a bunch of restaurants like that, though, isn't there? Yeah, there's a ton. Um, Brennan's in a lot, a lot of a lot of great American dishes come out of New Orleans, as you know. And Brennan's is one of the uh, finest uh, restaurants down there, and they created Bananas Foster, which was named after a uh, local businessman who used to eat there all the time. And Bananas Foster was when bananas were in season down in New Orleans. They took bananas and they took rum, which is also a big Caribbean spirit. And they took butter, which they got a lot of butter down in there in New Orleans because it's a French town. And then they said, well, you know how at Cherry's Jubilee, they, they throw some brandy on there and you're flaming. It's very dramatic. Well, sure. that's what they did with the bananas. And that's how Bananas Foster was uh, born. Um, and that's a yeah, that's a classic you can get in any good restaurant today. Yeah. And uh, Oysters Rockefeller came out of Antoine's restaurant, and it was called Oysters Rockefeller because they said it was so rich that it, it, only Rockefeller could make a dish like this. Um, <laughs> care for that characterization, um, but he as as he did not for a chock full of nuts. Um, motto, uh, better coffee, Rockefeller's money can't buy. He, right. I, he, I remember, yeah. yeah. But Oysters Rockefeller is a very rich dish of, of cream and, and uh, many, many other um, and liqueurs and so forth. That came out of there. The Mufaletta comes out of the Central Grocery Store, which is nothing but a grocery store in New Orleans that serves sandwiches. It was owned by a Sicilian American, and there was a strike. This is going back to oh, you know, 1906. There was a strike at the local, um, uh, uh, what do they call it, the streetcar uh, workers. And um, this was the poor boy sandwich was born because uh, these guys are, you poor boys, you want something to eat? And the mufaletta, mufaletta in Sicilian dialect means a kind of a sloppy old shoe. 
And <clears throat> what they did was take all these ingredients, put it on a big um, round seeded roll, and that's how the Mufaletta was born. So a lot of things come out of um, a lot of New Orleans. Uh, a lot came out of the restaurant Delmonico's, which is still going strong. I should mention that Brennan's and Antoine's and the Central Grocery are all still going strong in New Orleans. And um, Delmonico's, which opened back, is the first first restaurant in all of America to have opened back in 1837, even before Antoine's and the rest. And it's still going strong in New York as the original portals and so forth. They gave us the Delmonico steak, which is kind of a New York strip steak, Delmonico potatoes, and they gave the world lobster Newburg, <clears throat> which was named after one of their favorite customers, whose name was Newburg. And it's a lobster that has been taken out of the shell and mixed with <clears throat> sherry and cream and all sorts of condiments. And um, at one point, they had a falling out, the management of Delmonico's, had a falling out with Mr. Newberg, and for a time they call it Lobster Winberg. <laughs> <laughs> Silly change, right? Uh, the Parker House in um, in uh, the Parker House in Boston Hotel gave us guess what? Parker House rolls <laughs> on the top, and um, also gave us Boston cream pie, which is not really a uh, pie so much as a, a more like a cake. Um, they gave us chocolate cream pie. That was theirs. Um, in Louisville, um, a chef named Fred Schmidt at the Brown Hotel, <clears throat> which is still going strong, came up with something called the Hot Brown, which was a sandwich of turkey on uh, toast with um, with a Mornay sauce, a Mornay cheese sauce. That you can find. You don't find the Hot Brown outside of Louisville very much, but you can you find it all over that uh charming Kentucky city and its best edification is uh, is still at the at the hotel itself um, Irish coffee Irish coffee was more or less invented in America and what happened was that a newspaper man named Stan Delaplane <clears throat> was uh, in Shannon Airport where they were doing a Irish uh, whiskey promotion you got off the plane at the time, and they give you a little slug of Irish whiskey, and um, uh, he said, hey, this is a really great whiskey, and they added it to coffee, and Irish whiskey was born just as a stunt. He brought the news back to the uh, uh, Bella Vista um, uh, bar in San Francisco in Ghirardelli Square. Uh, this was back in 1952, and they really perfected it with this extremely wonderful, rich, creamy topic and it's very strong coffee. And boy, you know, McDonald's sold by the billions. Uh, well, they have sold millions upon millions and millions of Irish coffees at the uh, Buena Vista Bar. There's even a plaque there that said, on this day in 1952, Stan Delaplane arrived with the with the idea for Irish coffee. Um, uh, that's a good, that's a wonderful look. Pizza. Pizza, come on. American. Pizza? That, that can't be American. Well, I'm glad you asked, because although the original pizza margarita, we've told this story before on this show, uh, does come from Naples and does come from a specific pizzeria in Naples. Um, the pizza had been made and was that was made with the uh, with the tomato sauce and the green basil and the white mozzarella and to commemorate the Italian flag, the new Italian flag in those colors, and <clears throat> completely unknown outside of Naples. Nobody had ever had a pizza outside of Naples, uh, not in the north, not in Rome, not in Milan, nowhere. So the GIs come back to America and uh, popularize a dish that was already in New York as of the turn of the century, because a Neapolitan pizzaiolo opened uh, on Spring Street, uh, a place called G. Lombardi's, still there, although it moved. I think that's the original ovens. And he served the first pizza, Napolitana, in America. Um, and it took off, of course, uh, pizza as an item, as a food item, took off in New York. And then, but it spread to all of the east, eastern cities, uh, Boston, Providence, uh, all of these cities had their pizzerias. And then, as I said, when the GIs came back, they wanted pizza. 
and it just became a national phenomenon. So now, now you have all sorts of abominations. Uh, I don't even like Chicago pizza, but pineapple pizza. I mean, there 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 are. There are warrants out for the guy at California Pizza Kitchen who. <laughs> and rightly so. And right. rightly so. You know, I think we might be able to do a whole show on pizza about why uh, the, the, a round pizza is, is delivered in a square box and cut into triangles to eat. <laughs> so I, I bet there's a whole show about that. And certainly, you know, picking it up and folding it and eating it, we know is the only bus being three either current or former New Yorkers is the only way to eat pizza, but people eat it with a knife and a fork. Well, there, there is the great uh, fork and knife or folding crises among many. Um, eating it with a knife and fork is what you do in Italy 99% of the time, and they don't fold it to what they call a libretto, a little book. Um, that's, that's more of an Italian-American phenomenon of the way to eat it. Just as in America, for reasons I don't understand, we started twirling pasta in a tablespoon, mm. um, which they cannot imagine why we do that in America. Um, but that's very much And I was, you know, I was watching The Godfather for the 480th time because I could never not watch it. And there was an early scene with Don Corleone when he just moved to New York. Um, from Sicily, and he's with um, the other friends of his young friends, and they're twirling it. There they are, in their little, you know, Lower East Side apartment, eating spaghetti, and they're twirling it with a um, a spoon, so, uh, as the as the immigrants did. I don't know why, but all right. So we... let's let's say that for uh, another uh, maybe an, an entire episode or series of episodes. Uh, but what about things like? Uh... Uh, well, we know that um, there was a brat and, and other things like Nathan's hot dogs or the brats in uh, the way they serve it in Chicago or uh, Philly cheesesteak sandwiches or so subways, uh, subway sandwiches, subs. Are any of those American? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, subway sandwiches for what they are. I mean, they're just sandwiches that are popularized by Subway as being somehow diet food. But Philadelphia cheesesteaks were invented in, in, in Philadelphia by a specific place within the Reading Terminal Market. And uh, that's where they made it and became famous all over uh, the Middle Atlantic states. Um, you also mentioned another one, chili cheesesteaks and, and something else. Um, I mean, there's oh, the, the, the Nathan's hot dog. Right. It did exist before that. And, of course... Bratwurst, all kinds of German wursts were eaten all over America for the, because the German immigrants uh, brought them. But as a as the hot dog, as that kind of Nathan's Frank, Frankfurter, that was made famous at Nathan's and took the country by storm as a hot dog. Um, the the nobody knows who the first one to call the hot dog was, but there have been references to a. Um, a, a cartoonist of the time who grew, who used to draw dachshund dogs as hot dogs and um, others said there was dog meat in it which was preposterous of course but uh, no so nobody knows exactly where the term comes from but Nathan's um, just like the pizzeria I mentioned Gene Lombardi's was not the inventor of those dishes but did more to make them American dishes than anybody else and we could go. Did you know that I, I, I published five editions of the Encyclopedia of American Food and Drink, which answers all of these questions, Art? I, I, I did know that, but our audience didn't. And um, I was going to figure out some way to let you shamelessly plug that. And as you have kindly plugged in the past, uh, anybody can get my virtual gourmet by going to johnmariani.com and signing up you and your 10,000 closest friends free of charge. Every week you'll get it, whether you want it or not. Good. And, and before we go, let me write that down again. That was uh, the uh, Encyclopedia of... Oh, Encyclopedia of American Food and Drink. E-N-C-Y-C-L-O-P-E-D-I-A. And they'll be... by John <laughs> Mariani. Okay. Right. And then the, John Coleman, uh, will there be a link to that in uh, the description just under uh, the video uh, that will result from this? Will you see that there's a link to uh, where people can find that? Amazon.com. Ah, okay, that's easy. Yeah, I, I've actually, guys, I, I've got a copy of it hanging in my toilet. 
uh, uh, bathroom. Great for the smallest room in the house. Yeah. Uh, chances that uh-huh. fades when some moron says, ah, sure, a pizza was invented in, in uh, New Haven. Just get out the old encyclopedia and prove That's it. That's right. Strong. Oh. John, uh, all I can say is with the encyclopedia, you have put the McWhirter brothers to shame. <laughs> and uh, And we'll see you soon. Hope so. For more on Celebrating Act Two, visit our webpage, follow us on Facebook, subscribe to us on YouTube, and tell your friends. Celebrating Act Two is the user manual for the second half of your life.